Welcome to this episode of Orthodontics in Summary. Today's episode is a topic review looking at breathing disorders and orthodontics. This is a review of two lectures that took place in this year's AAO conference from 2022. Now, the two lectures that I'm going to be covering cover both aspects of the disorder. Takashi Ono's first lecture is going to look at the issues surrounding mouth breathing and the consequences of it. The second lecture fits into this quite well, which is looking at the management of obstructive sleep apnea in busy clinics by Martin Palomo, specifically the use of new technologies, how can overall manage these patients. Now just to recap, the Orthodontics and Summary podcast is an opinion piece from myself and the Orthodontics and Summary team. It may not be 100% representative of the original lecture, although we try our best to ensure that it is. Now back to the podcast. The first lecture was entitled, The Nose is for Breathing, What's Wrong with Mouth Breathing? And really the premise of Takeshi's lecture was to look at the issues with mouth breathing and the effects that take place. Now the initial quote, I think, set the pace for this lecture and the tone. And it was that although breathing is an automatic process, it doesn't mean we always get it correct. And the most common issue with breathing is the inefficiency that takes place through nasal resistance, i.e. something that causes patients to start mouth breathing. This lack of efficiency results in a greater rate of breathing and therefore less air is available to go to lower aspects of the lungs. Now Takeshi then spoke about the difference in pressure that gets created through mouth breathing and how that when we are mouth breathers there's 10 times greater pressure on the dentition due to the tongue. That's even more so when patients are supine. Now, when it comes down to memory and nasal breathing and mouth breathing, this was brand new to me. And what Takeshi described was how the normal process of memory takes place. Nasal breathers is considered to be normal. So consequently, what takes place is that we have airflow going in through the nose. It stimulates the sensory nerve receptors within the nose. That goes via the olfactory system through to the prefrontal and hippocampus. Now, these areas in the brain are also responsible for memory. So when patients are mouth breathing, this doesn't take place. Is there any evidence to support this? Well, yes, there's a systematic review by Robero 2016. And what they found was that there was a difference between mouth breathers and nasal breathers when it came down to memory consolidation. Now, this was really interesting. I looked back at the systematic review. There were some flaws with it. There were large studies that were carried out, but some of them had non-validated outcomes and also there were some studies with no controls. So it's not at the top of the evidence of hierarchy for us, but interesting nonetheless. And what Takeshi's conclusion was, is that really it's this lack of oxygen getting through, which results in an impairment in development and therefore memory as well. Other components, well, mouth breathers have a altered taste sensation. This was brand new to me as well. So what Takeshi described here is how for sweet and for taste, there's a change in the papilla. And the threshold for these nerve sense, for the sensory input is increased, i.e. patients experience sweet and sour less. When it comes down to the functional component of it, what's been found is that from a cross section, looking at masseters and temporalis muscles, there is a reduced cross section in mouth breathers. Also more type two muscle is evident as well. So the masticatory strokes are less efficient. An interesting study recently by Leone looked at the morphological changes of mouth breathers versus nasal breathers and found that the palatal shape was altered and it had a reduced volume to it. And my thoughts on this lecture was it was great to see how things in respiratory disorders have moved on in our understanding. We now have better ideas as to what takes place when it comes to either the morphology of patients or when it comes to what effects it takes place to taste and other components are now being explored. What I thought was still missing in our understanding really is what effects do those technical and morphological changes have to patient related outcomes? Does this make a discernible difference to them in their lives before we start thinking about interventions? But it's great to see the progress we've made in this field. The next lecture was by Martin Palomo. And this was looking at new technologies and how they can help manage obstructive sleep apnea in busy orthodontic offices. Now, he start, Martin started off by describing the prevalence of sleep apnea and how it is above 42 million just in the USA. We're looking at one in five patients being affected. But what Martin's real 
emphasis for his lecture was, was the 75% of severe sleep disorder cases which remain undiagnosed. And that's really where orthodontists come into the equation. We are not able to diagnose completely ourselves, as was mentioned in the white paper from the AJODO, which was authored by Rolf Berents in 2019. What we can do is carry out a risk assessment and move patients forward. So this was the first bit of where technology comes into it. For the adults, there is an online questionnaire that can be carried out. Really simple, eight questions. There's a link to it associated with this podcast, and it's called Stop Bank. Now, it is 100% accurate for these high-risk sleep apnea cases, and it was an initiative by the University of Toronto from Canada, and I must congratulate them for creating this really simple questionnaire, easy to carry out an assessment online and find out where our patients stand. What about our children? So children have a paediatric sleep questionnaire, or the PSQ, which is available through the University of Michigan and looks at a number of questions for patients. Now, when it comes to children, the disease presents itself in a different way. Children tend to have poorer academic performances, but seem to not have the same sleepiness associated with adults. But they snore loudly, and there's a correlation between the loudness of their snoring and what takes place with respect to their sleep apnea. So this is where technology then comes in to help out. There's a number of apps which are available which can be downloaded from the app stores. One is called Snore Lab, the other is called Snore Clock. And essentially what are they? Well, they're mobile apps that record the fractions of sounds coming out from snoring and categorizes the patient, quiet, light, and loud, and so forth. And this has been validated, and it is not too far off the scores that we get from polysonography. So we're looking at a really simple tool to allow analysis to take place. Now, it's not without its issues. It varies depending on the distance from the patient itself. So it's not a perfect tool, but at least it gives some indications for patients. Other components that can be carried out with technology. Well, there's different wearables now, whether they are, they are tapes, rings or bands. And they allow a whole host of information to be taken from the patient, similar to polysonography. Not to quite the same extent, but actually it does allow temperature control, heart rate pulse, and also oxygen levels to be mentioned. And they can stimulate certain triggers to take place. For example, if the oxygen level dips below 4%, there is a shock and alarm that, gets, that goes off to then alert the patient to wake up. He also described imaging and how imaging isn't just as simple as taking a cone beam CT because that only allows a partial assessment to take place. What we really need is a cross-sectional area. And this is information that I've heard before but never really been able to process. Martin gave a really exceptionally clear example as to how this takes place. Balloons. We can have two balloons that are of the same volume but we can change their shape. And this changing in the shape indicates the difference in resistance that takes place when oxygen passes through. The second thing that Martin mentioned as well was the collapsibility needs to be assessed. For example, musical instrument players tend to have a greater resistance to collapsing off the airway. There's a strength associated with the pharyngeal muscles. And that led him on to his conclusion, then described myo myotherapeutics, i.e. muscle exercises that can help strengthen the oropharyngeal musculature and therefore reduce the risk of collapsing taking place. And that brings us to the end of this topic review, looking at breathing disorders. Two lectures were covered from the AAO, and my reflection really on this topic is that we're still very much in its infancy, both looking at the effects of different breathing patterns on our patients, but also looking at how we can get better at diagnosing this heavily underdiagnosed disease that's in the population. Two quick updates for me. I had the fortune last weekend to travel to Germany where Bjorn Ludwig was delivering a course on a new material which will facilitate direct-to-print aligners, opening up new possibilities of aligners and line, aligner biomechanics. And the second thing is we're all aware of the humanitarian crisis taking place in Pakistan at this point in time due to the floods. Over 6.7 million people have been displaced and in need of immediate humanitarian aid according to the UN. This is a plea for myself, we're going to just set up a charity page and I encourage you all to make some donations to help in this cause. Please do subscribe and look forward to the next episode.